Good evening. And that voice you've heard is Mr. Rob Carlos. Rob, is that your real name, Carlos? It is. It is. That's a fabulous name. I mean, I would say where'd you get it from, but obviously your parents and your your history is back in the great city of Birmingham. I know you don't live there now, but uh, let's a little bit before we start the podcast, because we're here to talk about your your first book. Uh, three games in May, Manchester United when they won the treble. But let's talk about you, Rob Carlos, growing up in Birmingham first. Now you got involved in writing books. Um, thanks, Paul. So the way I got into this was uh, I've been watching football since around 1972, 19. I was taken to Villa games during those times. Can't remember them very well, but really started to get into them. About 74, 75 season. And that's when the Villa was in the second division. Uh, and we were vying for top spot with Manchester United. Now, nice. my, my dad had told me that Man United were one of the biggest clubs in the world. And I'm thinking, why are they in Division 2? Because we put them there. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> or part of the reason yeah. as to why. Um, and uh, it, it just... I, I, I loved that Villa-Man United thing. And it was very prevalent in that mid-70s period. And at school, um, I wanted to be a journalist um, and I wrote school articles and I interviewed uh, Ron Atkinson when he was first manager of uh, West Brom Mm -hmm. back in 79, 80. And uh, it was published in the school magazine. But then, you know, you leave school, you go your own way. You know, I got into uh, working in uh, business and in telecoms um, and I'll put it to the back of my mind for a while to be honest with you and then the 1999 European Cup final took place uh, What school did you go to Rob? Because we grew up in a similar part of Birmingham Was you BK or Sir Wilfs? No I was Sir Wilfs Yeah got ya Yeah I was the braiding mate, I was the green braiding Yeah Yeah exactly, so yes um, Was you BK then? No I was Kingshurst to be Gary Shaw You was Shawsy was oh, okay. Shawsy was fifth year when I went to Kingshurst, and that's where my my first understanding of Gary Shaw happened at Kingshurst Juniors when my teacher got me out of class and said, "You can't play for the fourth years yet because you you're a second year, and the only player that's ever played fourth year football at second year is Gary Shaw." There you go. And I thought, who's Gary Shaw? And then we went to, as you're going, because we're a similar age, you went to Wilfs in Tollcross. I went to Kingshurst, and I watched this kid, this blonde lad, on the playgrounds, and I said to me pals, who's this kid here? And I said, that's Gary Shaw. And I said, no wonder he played in the second year, in the fourth year. And that pretty much was the start of your villa love growing up and watching Gary Shaw from the Holt end. I watched Gary Shaw from the big playground at Kingshurst Comprehensive. Yeah, well, there you go. A little bit more uh, personal. Yeah, absolutely. For your one, mate. Very yeah. personal. But, yeah, I had some great times watching the Villa during um, that period. I mean, I could go back to the 76-77 season. Great when season. He had Andy... Oh, it's fantastic. Swashbuckling football is what I call it. Uh, during that season, we finished fourth and we got to the, uh, well, we won the League Cup and we lost to United in the uh, quarterfinals of the FA Cup as well. So he yeah, could have been a fantastic Andy, That's because yeah. Andy didn't play. Andy was injured. If Andy would have been fit for the whole of the season, you could have been writing your treble book about Villa 76, 77, because they were that good and they were that close from winning the treble. But that, roll that's it on. right. And and then in that same year, Liverpool needed it as well. Well, you because... see, the argument is with the treble, has any English club ever really won the proper treble? Now, I no. know United did because they won the league. They won the FA Cup against Newcastle. Cause we're gonna, that's what we're going to be talking about. And then they won that phenomenal game against Bayern Munich 
when to all intents and purposes if you turn the television off at 90 minutes you would have gone to bed thinking Bayern would have won it but you know when you look at it the year before it was Arsenal that won the league so in new money if you finish in the top four you go into the Champions League but they're not champions in the olden days when Villa won the league they then went into the European Cup. You had to win your own Football League Championship. So, you know, it is a grey area, but, you know, it is what it is. We are where we are, and United did win, but Liverpool were very close in 77 when Manchester United beat them 2-1 at Wembley. Correct. Yeah, correct. Um, they'd won the league. Uh, they lost the FA Cup and then a few days later they beat Borussia Mönchengladbach Cause in was... the uh, 77 final. So, yeah, they were very, very close. Because, mm-hmm. again, in them days, the games were close as well, wasn't they? You'd have the, the FA Cup and then it was pretty much on to, to the European Cup. And I think that's what happened with Manchester United. They beat Newcastle at Wembley 2-0, two, two Paul Scholes. And my favourite player of that era, Teddy Sheringham. And then on the Wednesday after, they met Bayern Munich. But let's go back to the beginning of that season. Arsenal were the champions. Manchester United, it was the class of 92, plus a few other players. Roy Keane was the main man. But in that final, Keane only lasted eight minutes, didn't he? He did, he, he did, and and you're quite right in what you say there, Paul, in, in terms of start of the 98-99 season, it did look as if, you know, they'd uh, handed the baton over to Arsenal, mm. uh, and they would be the dominant club, and in the book, um, they played 63 games, and, and, and I call the first one the Charity Shield, yes, against against Arsenal. And Arsenal won it at a canter, three goals to nil. Mm. I've got quite a lot of fan contribution in the book. And all of them say that, you know, they, they came out of the ground that day and that by the night August season mm-hmm. opener. And, uh, you know, all the Arsenal fans were saying that that's it. You know, you've handed everything over to us now. You've had a good run for the last four or five years and, that, and, and now it's down to us. But it was neck and neck during the season with, with both of them. It was a fantastic two teams and obviously culminated in the uh, FA Cup semi-final, which was the turning point of the season for United and the reason why I wrote the book in the end. And the Cup semi-final, it was um, it was a replay, wasn't it, at Villa Park? It was a replay. Um, we played, that they played at um, Villa Park on the Saturday. And then they were back on the uh, Wednesday for it. It was it wasn't a great game in that first semi final, uh, cat and mouse. Uh, and then it just lit up in the uh, in the semi final. But you know it, it, it's fine lines, isn't it? Life is fine lines. Football is fine lines. If Burkamp would have scored that penalty in the 90th minute, Arsenal would have gone through. Uh, they would have probably won the league as well. Uh, and and beaten Newcastle again in the in the FA Cup final, but it wasn't to be. And 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 to me, Peter Schmeichel during that game, you know, he 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 was the pinnacle reason, the the turning point that you know gave Manchester United the uh, impetus to go on and do what they did in May of of that year. But he'd been vilified at the start of the season. Um, he had intended to retire and told a few select people at Manchester United and perhaps the fact that he hadn't told everybody else meant that he started the season in bad form Mm. and people were saying that his career was over but as United picked up the momentum going in from the end of 98 to 99 that is when he started to come into his own Wasn't that Schmeichel's last season uh, playing for Manchester United, though, the, the 80... The, it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, ni- the 98-99. Yeah, His yeah. last thing was to pick up the European Cup with Roy Keane uh, suspended for the final. 
So it was, you know, that was the last thing he did as a Manchester United uh, player. I mean, you that know, ain't what a bad way to bow out. Again, it, it, when you're looking at players, I mean, what age was Michael when he bowed out at United? Because he did play for Aston Villa and he did play for Manchester City. So, you know, what age was Michael then when he bowed out at United? Because it's all. I think he was about 31, 32, yeah. mate. Yeah. When he did so, because he came to the villa when he was about 35, yeah, yeah. something like that, and, mm. and and the season he was with us. So, yeah, you know, he'd had, you know, a great eight or nine years at Manchester United. And again, you know, when and you... he'd won on many points, didn't they? When you oh, think absolutely. About when you look at Schmeichel, you look at the star jump kind of save. He, he invented that, didn't he? He made himself he so big. He put, you know, literally like a starfish coming out to forwards and frightening the lives out of him. Well, he, he gave him a good 15 points a season, didn't oh, he? Oh, 100%. What a, I mean, one of the great the great goalkeepers that we've seen, you know, in modern totally. times. Because, I mean, what we do tend to get caught up in, I don't get caught up in that, but lots of people do these days, and certainly the news outlets do, that football was invented in 1992. And, um, you know, when you're looking at players, it's all about the players of the modern era of the last 30 years. And if we're going to judge players of the last 30 years, Schmeichel is one of the greats. When you look at that Manchester United side, the midfield would have been uh, Giggs, Scholes, Keane and Beckham. What a tremendous midfield. It's not bad, is it? No, and then, of course, the forward line would have been Yorkie and Cole and um, Solskjaer and Sheringham. A great four pair, any two from that four. What I found interesting about Manchester United at that time is my football club, Birmingham City, and, you know, I, I get into lots and lots of spats over. Uh, yes, I am a Birmingham City supporter. And lots of Birmingham fans, especially in the Lee Clark era, um, there was a lot of things coming out of there. And no, that they, they these stories can't be true because all football players get on with each other. They all love each other. No, no, no. Give your head a wobble. Players are just normal people. Football is their job. And in particular in that Manchester United side, Keane, Sheringham, Sheringham, Cole, there was a number of players that didn't talk, didn't like each other. That's right. It, you know, it's it. You, you're right. This was a job to them. Mm. But, it, you know, they were... That they just came about at the right time, and and an, an, another big difference between Arsenal and Man United on that night, when in the FA Cup semi-final, was the bench, because he uh, the Ferguson was able to bring on his big guns, mm. and one of them was Ryan Giggs, who obviously went on to score that wonderful goal in the uh, in, in the extra time period. So the, the 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 thing about Ferguson that season was that he knew when to pick his players. He knew what his best eleven was, but he knew how to keep everybody else happy and on their toes as well. And it worked perfect as they got to those last three games of the season. But the reason why I wrote the book, Paul, is because it fascinates me beyond anything that, you know, a football team can win three games on the trot. Every single football team is capable of doing that and, 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 and often do. But the thing that gets me about that treble winning season was they played 60 games, including the Charity Shield. They played 60 games and won nothing. They could have left yeah. the season with absolutely nothing at all. And yet, game 61, they win the league. Game 62, they win the uh, FA Cup. And then game 63, they win the Champions League as well. And they do it in the final seconds of the game. And that was the big thing about United that season. They just never knew when to give up. You know, I go back to the first game of the season because in the book, there's a couple of chapters called Red or Dead. Yeah. Red being United doing well or 
the dead part is that they didn't do too well. So the first game I pick is the Arsenal three, Manchester United nearly in the charity shield. And everybody's going, right, that's it now. Wenger's going to do it again and all that kind of stuff. But even in that first home game of the season, they played Leicester City and were two down with around 12 minutes to go. And Messrs Beckham and Sheringham score goals. Uh, and that they, 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 you know, get back in the game. They, they didn't win it, but they drew 2-2. Two, two. But there's so many ex- examples of them coming from behind. Liverpool in the FA Cup, fourth round, is a, is, is a good example. So they never did it the easy way at all. You know, Juventus in the semi-final of the, the Champions League. It, it's just... To me, Manchester United in, in, in that nine-month period depict the greatest of sporting excellence. And you know what? Mm. You can take what they did, and this is something I've tried to get across in the book. You know, it's life itself as well, Paul. You never give in. You follow your dream, and sometimes they become reality. And in the face of adversity, which is something that United experienced a few times they came through their last game that they lost was uh december 8 uh, 98 when they lost two nil at home to middlesbrough and then they never lost another game uh, after that phenomenal absolutely phenomenal but you know liverpool could have won the quadruple last season you know that i mean in the end they didn't come very close to it they, they came close to winning the treble in 76, 77 uh, season, as we've said. But it was it's it's how United did it as well. You know, winning, 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 and you pick up three of the greatest trophies that you know any club in this country and in Europe can 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 have. It's only been done a few times as well. So it was just an amazing time. The backdrop was that they were looking to be sold as well. United are the only you know are the only team to have won the treble, aren't they, in this country? In in, in England, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Celtic have done it. Yes, yeah. Uh and, and Ajax, yeah. Barcelona, yeah. Bayern Munich have done it. And I think Juventus have as well. Yeah. Uh, so so it's ha- it, it it has happened. Mm, but, but I'd wager this country. I'd wager the emotion, you know, what 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 depicts football you know, will n- nothing will be like what Manchester United in, in, in endured in, in, in that season. And part of the reason why I wanted to write the book uh, is that I wanted it from a, a fan's point of view as well. Yeah. So I wanted to speak to people that had gone to the game. So I'd met them. I Zoomed calls with them. You know, we did it on the phone, like we're doing now and all that kind of stuff. And the stories were just absolutely fantastic. You know, you, you, I went through the emotions with them. I felt like I'd been there with them, mm. you know, from, from you know, the first games of the season right through to the end. They're, they're just stories, brilliant football stories that will make you cry and laugh at the same time. How many contributions uh, did you have, Rob? Of, I had of, about of eight fans. or nine in the end. Yeah. I had about eight or nine uh, fans. Uh, that had uh, that had gone to the game, so it was it was just totally wonderful, and and that was the biggest thing in the book, to ensure that what they experienced, you know, during that period of time, I captured it properly for them, and I've had nothing but good feedback from them. Good. So it, it's it, it it's that was important to me, mm-hmm. you know, and I had uh, the likes of Clive Tilsley. Uh, who obviously did the legendary commentary that day. Yeah. Uh, I've had some great contributions from him. Steve Bruce had given me some, um, uh, did a great forward for me as well, as did Neil Custis from The Sun, who incidentally uh, became the chief correspondent uh, for The Sun for them in the um, summer of 1999. I bet he, he was, I bet he was torn, wasn't he? That Geordie, that Geordie boy. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly, exactly. But he, he'd gone to the final and was in the press box, but he'd gone there not to work. It was a bit of a busman's holiday for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, he found his uh, then-girlfriend up on the, the morning after in Barcelona and said, I want, I want to cover this. 
And then the, the, I think it was a guy called Peter Fitton retired and he got the job and he's right. been there ever since. Um, so it's, um, it's just, I've had some fantastic stories. The players have given me a bit as well as, as and when they can. But, what you know, players I just, have contributed, Rob? Well, as I said, I've got Steve Bruce. Yeah. Uh, I've got some, um, you know, smaller quotes from, from other players as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Roy Keane uh, is in there. It's just bits that, you know, I've been able to pick up as well. Um, so, you know, and obviously acknowledged. So it's it's been a great, how can I put it, across the board view from the, you know, from the people with the mics to the people with their football boots on to the fans. It's just, a, you know, just a marvellous, marvellous story. And so that that goes on all, all through the book. And have you found it being, because with these, these books, generally speaking, I think, um, Neil Custis is a great example and for, for me I always believe that you should write, if you're a professional you're a journalist, you should write your love is football but not about your own club because I think you can get too close to your own club, so writing about other clubs and then you get that information from the fans, from people that are around the football club some of the players etc I think you get an even greater bonding and an even greater satisfaction in your production when you do something that's not so close to home, but very close to heart. Totally true, mate. Totally true. You know, that that's exactly what I found. I'd had this story in my head almost after that final whistle because of the way that they won those three games. And I always said I wanted fan contribution, mm. but I just kept it in my head. And then we had lockdown. And then I thought, yeah, it's time now to, to do the book. So, yeah, I, 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 uh, I did a lot of research, spoke to a lot of people. Uh, I got nothing but respect for the Manchester United fans that I spoke to. They were just absolutely wonderful with me. And another reason why I wrote the book, Paul, as well, uh, if, if I may, is that... Um, I've wrote it in association with Prostrate Cancer, yeah. who, uh, again, donations from, from the book as well. And the reason for that is that my dad had prostate cancer uh, and he'd recovered from it, but he decided to go on to their, um, I'll call it guinea pig for, for want of a better word, for the, you know, for the drug trials. Yeah. Uh, and at, at times, mate, it really, really messed him up. Mm. But he always said, I, I want to do it because of the fact that I, I'm allowing people, in, you know, down the line to, to have a better quality of life. Yeah. And I went to him about 18 months ago and said, look, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this. And he went, son, write the first chapter and bring it back so I can have a look at it. So I did exactly that, Paul. I wrote it. Uh, typed it up, took it to him, sat there. Uh, I was like being at an interview mm-hmm. when he was reading it and he put his glasses on and he read it. 15 minutes later, he puts the paper down, takes his glasses off and he says, son, you've got to write this. And I just smiled at him and I went, dad, if I do it, I'm going to get prostate cancer involved. He said, do that. That would be a lovely touch. So I got prostate cancer involved, and a couple of weeks later, Dad passed away. Oh dear. But but he will. But and and, and you know it, it's it's the biggest cancer killer in men. Mm. So you know for for me to have it in my in honour of my dad and knowing that prostate cancer were involved in it, you know, uh, it, and and they've got a bit in the book as well where that where they write about, uh, you know the. Uh, it, the, what they're trying to do with the charity so it was just wonderful and the book is dedicated to my dad as well um, along with uh, those that perished in Munich in 1958 as well yeah I mean what a lovely touch so I'll make it poignant yeah and, what a, and again what a great touch United European Cup winners uh, in 68 10 years after Munich and in uh, 1999, Ferguson, you mentioned fine margins. 
I do a podcast with 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 Huddy, and we always talk about how instrumental management is. And when Fergie walked into those gates there at Old Trafford, it wasn't all plain sailing, and he was arguably a, a game away that that replay against what was it, Crystal Palace? No, not it was Nottingham Forest. Was and it I'm Nottingham glad you Forest? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you've mentioned this because. I wanted the centrepiece to be those three games in May, hence why mm-hmm. it's titled that. But I wanted to go back 10 years before and 10 years after. Yeah. And it starts off with the FA Cup draw in December 1989, where Forest are drawn at home to um, uh, Manchester United. It was chosen as one of the live games of the BBC that weekend in January when we do that third round. And, you know, the, the general consensus was he loses this and he's out of a job. Uh, and they won 1-0 through Mark Robbins. Um, but what people forget is that in the next round, they played Hereford away. And that was another banana skin where mm. he could have lost his job. But they won 1-0 with Clayton Blackmore in the 84th minute. And then they started to get build momentum from that moment onwards and they never played at Old Trafford once during that campaign it was away games all the way through to the final so you know that say that the FA Cup effectively kept him in his job but in Ferguson's mind he wanted to be top of the tree in the league but he knew that he had to have a couple of seasons where they weren't quite good enough to do so Mm. and then they win the uh, European Cup Winners Cup the following season and, the, and then they win the League Cup for the first time in 92 and then as you know that's when he built his first great teams when um, especially during the 93-94 season when he's bought in uh, Roy Keane uh, he's got that talisman called Eric Cantona and that was the first great team that he built second being the 98-99 and then I would say arguably the best team was 10 years later yeah when they beat Chelsea in the uh, in the 2008 uh, Champions League final, they were far more European during then. But you know, fair credit to the Manchester United board, where Fer- Fergie wouldn't be afforded the time now no, if no, he'd be manager no. right now. No. But they stuck with him, and you know, he started to win trophies after a good four or five years. There's quite a lot of similarities between. Their last trophy was in 85 when they beat Everton in the FA Cup final. Then their next trophy is beating Crystal Palace in 1990. So that's a five-year gap. Mm. This year with Eric Ten Hag, it's a six-year gap. Mm. So who knows whether history will, will, will repeat itself. But, you know, he built three great dynasties and I wanted that um, to be to be, you know, the message of that being brought across as well, that, you know, football doesn't have to be trigger happy. There, you know, the, the, there is a long-term project that people are looking at. And United, you know, they, they're, um, they're bored with Martin Edwards and all, and all those guys. You know, they kept him because they believed in him. And, and, and look what they received back from you know from 1990 all the way through to what 2013 when he when he retired so yeah it goes back to 1989 and it goes forward to 2009 as well so you know it it, it does that i also feature what was going on in the world as well in 98 99 so you know not just whilst united were, were, were going on this fantastic run but what was going on around them uh, in the world as well, so I, I've made it as as open as I can do. Uh, but you know, we, we're starting to get the reviews for uh, for it. It comes out on the 21st of March, which incidentally is a day uh, is exactly a year since my dad died. So it's quite poignant uh, that we're doing that. So yeah, it's all systems go, mate. Uh, I'm very very proud of it. Um, whether you're a Man United fan or not. It's just a great story of a team coming together, being managed by one of the greatest managers of all time. And what they did during that time as well, it was never easy for them, like I said. So it's just a fantastic story. I don't think we will ever 
have that again. I don't where, think we'll. Where... Yeah, I don't think we'll ever have a dominant force like Manchester United again because the the way that football is today, it's completely different to as it was back then. I mean, Ferguson took over from Ron after the nineteen eighty six. Uh, World Cup finals and Fergie was afforded the luxury of buying players that that Big Ron wasn't. Big Ron wanted to buy uh, Terry Butcher for instance. I think Mm. he wanted to partner him with with Paul McGrath. Big Ron had got big, big ideas but the Man United board at the time didn't share his ideas. However, when Ferguson walked in there, I do remember they spent some Big transfer fees. I think Robbo went there. Dini Remy Moses went there. There was a, a lot of million pound plus players going to Old Trafford. And and I remember at the time, a lot of people were saying, he spent an awful lot of money, Ferguson, and nothing's really happening. He ain't far away from the sack, hence the conversation a few minutes earlier. So he was on a dodgy wicket, but the Man United board did did stand the ground and did, you know, have the confidence of Ferguson. And as you yeah. say, the rest the rest is history. And I think it's a, a great lesson for the modern day that if you do believe in a manager, Arsenal, I think, have done very well quite recently with... Um, they have. Yeah, with, with, with the fellow they were, they were going to sack him uh, exactly. not, not too long ago. But... Arteta now has come good and he might be bringing silverware to work uh, to the Emirates. So football is a funny game. You've just got to let it bed in at times. Correct. Correct. Can I do the plug in now of the book as well, where they can, uh, where your uh, listeners you can? Uh... You certainly can. And also, before we talk about the European <laughs> final, because I want to talk about that yep. night in Barcelona, um, your publishers as well, because... You know, without them, the book doesn't arrive on people's doorsteps, does it? Through the letterboxes no. that they're going to order from. No, I've um, I've gone with uh, a, 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 a publisher called Morgan Lawrence. Um, two guys, Matt and Barry, that uh, run the show there. I pitched it to them. We went through various scenarios, and they've been nothing but supportive uh, on that. So, you know. They're getting busy for the uh, for all the pre-orders that are going out now. And if any of your listeners want to buy the book, which is at fifteen ninety nine with donations made to prostate cancer, all they need to go is uh, all they need to do is go to www.morganlawrence.co.uk, and all the details will be on there. So yeah, I'm I'm very pleased with my publishers. You know they've gone through every step with me, and we've uh, you know we've gone through all the the doubts and the hardship and all that and we're coming out the other end and we're all you know gearing for uh hopefully uh, a good book for people to read and let's talk about barcelona that balmy night by munich one manchester united two but at 90 minutes it was by munich one manchester united nil it was an incredible final Time, it was time added on, wasn't it, that they scored and both goals from a corner? It was. Um, as you quite rightly say, you know, uh, Bayern took the lead in the first uh, six minutes. I think he was on the sixth minute uh, when they scored. Uh, and then there was no more goals until, as you quite rightly say, the, the injury time part. But if you remember, um, Bayern had hit the post, had some really good chances in the last 20 minutes or so to put the game, you know, beyond the reach of, of United. And I think, and I remember watching it on TV and I'm thinking, United are going to win this. Did you? Because, oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. I did. And, and the general consensus of the, of the fans in there is that, you know, is, is our name on this trophy? You know, the, yeah. Bayern have missed some great chances. So, yes, you're quite right. Um, they score a couple of minutes into injury time and that first one is scored by Terry, Teddy Sheringham, across by David Beckham, as we know. Uh, Peter Schmeichel had gone up for that one. In fact, he got his head to the ball as the ball came across. Uh, Yorkie will, uh, will testify to that in one of the books that he's written because he remembers it skimming off his head. 
uh, and then goes back into goal. Uh, but when he's going up for the corner, uh, it's quite funny, really, because Fergie and uh, Steve McLaren, who was his number two at that time, were going, what's he doing coming up for this? But, you know, he played his part in it, and then he goes back to the goal. And when, when they go back to the centre circle to kick off, you know, you've got Ollie and uh, and Sheringham going, this is great, we've got another half hour of this. Mm. And then, um, you know, Beckham puts that corner in, Sheringham flicks the, the ball on, and Ollie's there to put his foot out, and it goes high into the net, and they've won 2 one It's absolutely amazing. But there's, there's a great story in the book by one of the guys who uh, was also one of the stewards on the night from Manchester United, and he'd been told to leave the game on, 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 on 85 minutes, effectively, to get back to the coaches so he can make, make sure that the fans get back in, in time. And he's going out the gate. He sees um, none other than George Best. Blimey. And, Be- and Best is going, yeah, we've lost this now and, and whatever. And you know, I'm just, I need to find the nearest bar, basically, is what, what George Best said to... to to uh, to one of my contributors, uh, and then they hear this roar. Uh, my uh, my contributor gets a, a text on his phone off his son who's still in the in the uh, stadium. We've scored, Dad. We've equalised. So he's dragged George Best back, and he's dragged them all back in, thinking we're going to have another half hour. So we need to, we can't go to our coaches yet. And as they're walking back through, the second goal goes in. So then they have to go back out again and think. But, I mean, it's just wonderful stories like that. You know, the, the United fans that I spoke to, they, they they didn't really see that second goal because they were still celebrating yeah. the fact that they got back into the game. So it's just, it's just a wonderful sporting story, which whether you like Manchester United or not, it, it it's just true sporting excellence, mate. Absolutely. I mean, I, I I love all football. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's my team or anybody else's team. I love to see, you know, some of these monumental occasions and trebles and doubles. And it doesn't matter what it is in football. And I think it's fantastic that you've got publishing companies that are giving authors like yourself, Rob, the, uh, the, the, the blank canvas, if you like, to contribute and get supporters views and players views and stick it on your book and 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 then the games and that season are never forgotten because they're there in the memory banks it's okay you can go onto youtube and you can you know talk to your mate down the pub but to read it in a book and open the book and you've got it there in black and white i think it's absolutely fantastic well i hope the readers um enjoy the stories from the fans because that really is the crux of it mm. you know you and i have stood on the terraces we we've we've we didn't we didn't get on the pitch you know to play in these big games but we stood on the terraces and we we had our mates there and we've got our own stories but <clears throat> to hear the man united fans uh talk about it, it's just wonderful mate just totally wonderful Absolutely, and you've got another couple of books um, out, and um, one Sean Till you've been working with Sean, and the League Cup. Uh, yeah, as well. uh, that's that's for next year. The Sean Till book comes out later on this year. Uh, I've had a great three or four months uh, working with him on the book again. It's down to Morgan Lawrence, so I'm working with those guys again on on the book. And yes, I'm working on the history of the uh, League Cup. So it's a season by season of every single final uh, in the 20th century. Uh, and then I'm picking the best of the 21st century as well. And of course, you know, probably the most important final, although it grieves me to say it, obviously, is when you guys uh, won it in 2011. Do because you think so? Why? I do, it, was, it was a massively important game, Paul, and I'll tell you why, right? You mentioned the 1992 being the start of football as we know it with Sky. Every final that the Sky Six got involved in, okay, uh, was won by them. The only the only one was Everton versus Man United in the 1995 FA Cup final. 
then, you know, every time United got to a final, Arsenal got to a final, they, they won them. So there was no shocks like we'd had with Luton in the League Cup, mm, uh, yeah. Oxford. Mm, um, Milk Cup, yeah. Yeah, Southampton, West Ham winning the FA Cup. There was with no real shocks. Uh, and I know Portsmouth won it in 2008, but they were the first division club. Mm. And I think the team they played was Cardiff, who was, were a championship team at the time. Yeah. Birmingham were not, were not favourites in, in any way, shape or form mm. and won it. And, and to me, it's the most important cup win since the, the, the shocks of Wimbledon and Luton and all those guys. I really do think that. And the season after, Wigan did it to Man City yes, in yeah. the FA Cup final. Mm. Uh, and it's not been done since. You know, Swansea won it a couple of years later, but they beat a fourth division team mm. or an old fourth division team in Bradford in the final. So, yes, um, that that part will be a big contribution from, from Birmingham fans. And I'll obviously be coming to you for it as well, sir. Yes. I've, um, I've tried my best. I've put a few... Uh, heads towards your your way that, you have. that played you in have. major and finals in great the stories. 70s. Yep, yep. I've got some uh, great stories coming up, so thank you for that, sir. I do appreciate it. And going back to Dwight York, did you um, get any contribution from John Gregory? Because he, he, he was the manager at Aston Villa when Dwight York got transferred to Manchester United, wasn't he? He wasn't yeah, really happy at the time, was he, John? He wasn't. He wasn't. It's a good job he never had a gun uh, at the time. Can you imagine that being said now? I know. It's crazy, isn't it? You it can't even not, call a bloke a bloke not these Gary days. Gary off that top spot oh, dear me. all day long. All day long today, if he'd have said that, most definitely. But we batted, We never batted an eyelid, did we? No, we never because, batted an eyelid. because we were proper people back in them days. You know, John Gregory, if I got a gun, I'd shoot the bastard. <laughs> But, That's what I mean. but he didn't actually mean that he was going to get the gun and shoot him. Of course like he that. never. But that's what yeah. people say. That's what football people used to say and, and certainly think back in our day. It didn't happen, of course, but but that's what it was. It was a different world. I it think it was a, a better world. world. We said what we, what we, what we thought. And we didn't have social media jump on our backs and wanting to take us to task. And you shouldn't be saying that. You can't call him that. You can't. You know, you can call anybody what you liked in our day. We were big enough. We were bold enough. We were brave enough to take it on board. And you say, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I think the kids could take a, a big part out of that phrase because that's what I've always I, I agree. My life can by. you imagine, mate? Can you imagine that if Gregory said this today? Oh, it would be on social media feed. Oh, dear me. Would be absolutely full, mate. It would be full. But um, it, it, that that is mentioned in the book as well. I'd love but, John uh, to go on his socials and say that about your good. Well, I'm, uh, I, I also host uh, events for the for the uh, villa. <coughs> Excuse me, mate. Um, down in um, down by the coast as well because I live uh, down here now. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping that John Gregory will be there one day so I can uh, I'll ask him that very question. But if you remember, none of us. It we it wasn't even a conversation piece nah. in the pub. No, no. Oh, no. you see what Gregory said. Don't know about oh, no, yeah. no Typical about John. No. Yeah. But again, so that was it. That's what it would be. Typical Correct. John, but you had managers that would say it like that back in the. It was before, you know, the, the Sky TV, the BBC, the 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 media savvy football industry got its claws into it, and and it's now such a sterile place where journalists can't talk to players. Players are, are very away from it you get the mix zone you'll be lucky if you get a chat with with a player in those days everything was open the the journalists would travel on the trains or the planes to to the games with the players and there was a you know the, there was a togetherness within that football club and, and now correct. no no it's not and you know correct it's uh, it's a worse place for it mate in my opinion but, well but there I, you go. I, I, 
I'll have my final word on this part, Paul, right? In our day, you could be in your local pub and you and, and, and the footballer uh, who plays around your area would be in there. Kind of sure when I was working the Bradford. Absolutely. That's right. You know, you, you, you'd often see, and I mean, I never went up to them because I didn't want to, uh, you know, they were, they were out of work as far as I was concerned. Mm. <laughs> but sorry, mate. But um, nowadays, if they come into your local pub, there'd be about 10 people in before them, part of their entourage, mm-hmm. looking around, making sure. So it, it's, it's you know, that footballers back in those days were one or two rungs on the social rung above us, but they were approachable. Now, now it's a completely different ball game. When I speak to some of the ambassadors that are ex-pros, that you know do ambassador work at their clubs. They can't get they can't get in with the the uh, the, the 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 new players. You know mm-hmm. they're just not allowed anywhere near them. And it's a shame, but there it you is. go, Paul. That's what it's all about. It is because a lot of the ambassadors, the players of these days, you know, aren't good enough to lace their boots. But well, there you, go. you know, it, 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 that's the way it is. But yeah, I used to work in pubs and clubs in Birmingham and and had uh, many a time. It's certainly. With my team, Birmingham City, Oppie, and, and those boys up and down Broad Street. And yeah, exactly. Uh, happy memories. I mean, you know, you wouldn't get it today. And, and of course, going back to as we started with Gary Shaw, Shaw's, he would always go in the Bradford. I'd often see yeah. Gary in there. He'd be in there, he'd yeah, have a shandy. Exactly. I mean, yeah, to be exactly. fair, it's the only time I know Shaw's, he'd not drink proper alcohol. It was always a, sh- a shandy in them days. <laughs> Well, but, there you go. But there a man, a man of the people, and just a working class kid that made good, which is what all them players, and up to really nineteen ninety nine, you know, them players were exactly. But yeah, then, exactly. But then it changed when the millennium clicked over. Something a little bit like with nineteen ninety two, ninety three, with the Premier League, the millennium bang changed everything and. That's another story for other time, mate. Let's try and turn the hands of time back. But thank you so much, Rob, for your contribution, for your book. Can I wish you all the very best? And we will reconvene with uh, with your next book that's coming out. Yeah, we'll we'll get Tealy on the show as well for you. But can I just uh, tell people again, the book is called Three Games in May. Uh, It's written in association with Prostrate Cancer. Uh, and you can get it from local bookshops, but go to Morgan Lawrence and get straight from there because they're fantastic. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Cheers, pal. All the best, mate. Take care, mate. Bye-bye. Speak soon, and thanks for listening, guys. Cheers, Rob. Bye-bye, mate. Bye-bye.